Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst the men. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Our Lady, help us praise you. Our Lady of good success. Our Lady of perpetual suffering. Pray for us. St. John Uarius. Pray for us. St. Pius X. Pray for us. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're looking at sin. So does sin hurt God? Yeah. Zachary, it does? How? Does God change? Will you? No. no change in God? No change in God? No change in God, is there? No, God can't change. Why can't God change? You know, why he's can't... always God. He's always God, yes. Because he's perfect, and if you change, you would either lose the perfection, right. or gain the perfection if you can't do it. Yes, he's infinitely perfect in all things, so God does not change. So how does, when you sin, does it offend God then? Or does it hurt God? Did I get a wound when you sin? Because God doesn't change, does he? But what happens, uh, Angela? Because he loves you and you, you repay him by right. not returning the love he wants you to give him. Right. And you're disobeying the rules that he gave to you. Yes. And they were pretty weak as well too. So. That's all true. So that hurts God when you do that. Yes. How does it hurt him then? Because he gets offended because he expects your love and all you so we can't hurt God in his nature. In his nature, he can't be changed. We can deprive him of the honor that is due to him. We have to give all, at the, at the Mass, we say all honor and glory at the end of the canon there. We say all honor and glory to God. We have to give honor and glory to God. When we don't do that, we deprive him of honor that he should receive from us. So it doesn't hurt him in his nature. We cannot hurt him in his nature. Because his nature doesn't change. He can't be injured. We can't do anything to God. and uh, We can't uh, injure him in any way. But we can injure him by depriving him of his honor that is due to him. See, so the modernists say, well, we can't injure God in his nature, so sin doesn't hurt God. So therefore, we don't need to worry about sin. Because it doesn't hurt God. So we don't need to worry about it. But it does deprive him of honor that is due to him. And God's uh, jealous of his honor. He wants that honor that is due to him, and uh, we can't deprive him of it. So that's, that's, that's the offense in sin. And that's why he made the fourth commandment. You know, he didn't say, love your mother and father. He said, honor your mother and father. And so your mother and father represent, uh, they represent God. They're his representative. So you have to honor them. And the honor you give them goes to God because they're his representatives. So uh, that's why it's important to honor our, our mother and father. And we honor them uh, by especially uh, being obedient. Being obedient and, uh, and following their, their rules. And this is how we honor God as well, like Angela just said, by following his commandments and following his rule, we honor, we honor God. We say, I'll do this for the honor of God because this is what... God wants me to do. So we deprive him of honor when we sin, and that's the that's what we do to God. So we don't affect him in his nature. Sin does not hurt God's nature. That's true. Does not hurt God's nature. And this is what the modernists say. They say, so then we don't have to worry about sin. It's not serious. It doesn't hurt God. We can't hurt God. It's impossible to hurt God. So sin doesn't really bother God. But sin does. Sin deprives God of honor and glory. It is due to him. So that's where the sin hurts God. It deprives him of something that is his, that belongs to him. So that's why we have to do penance for sin. That's what the sin does. So sin is an evil, and it does require uh, penance. It does require sorrow. It does require uh, contrition. Any questions on that? Anastasia? I don't, I don't have any questions. You don't have any questions? Okay. Good. All right. All right we're up here now. 
We already did this, didn't we? What is satisfaction or penance? You do that question? Zachary, what's the answer? Were you here last time? Did you already do that question? Angela? Is satisfaction giving what is due to God? Yes. Uh, it just says satisfaction or penance is that prayer or other good work which the confessor enjoins on the penitent in expiation of his sins. What does enjoin mean? Enjoin. So the, the confessor enjoins a, pen, a penance on you. Is it um, when you enjoin someone to do something, you, you tell them to do something? You ask him? Like, yeah. Him yeah, you're, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Obligates. Pardon me? Obligates. Abrogates? Obligates. Obligates. Obligates, yes. Yep, you better, yeah, I think. Obligates, yeah. So, an expiation of his sins. What is absolution? Benny, do you know? The remission of sins. Pardon me? The remission of sins. The remission of sins, yes. Absolution is the sentence which the priest pronounces. Remember, you're in judgment, so you get a sentence. The priest pronounces in the name of Jesus Christ when remitting, remitting the penitent sin. So it uh, takes away the sin of the penitent. What part of the sin does it take away? Firstly. Joseph, do you have your hand up? Oh, I thought you did there. Zachary. It takes away the punishment. Uh, and, uh, Emily. Is it eternal punishment, Joseph? Eternal punishment, yes. But before that, what does it take away? Temporal punishment? No. Emily? The guilt? The guilt, yes. It takes away the guilt of sin. You're no longer guilty. You've been forgiven. And once you're forgiven, you're no longer guilty. So it takes away the guilt, and it takes away the eternal punishment. Anastasia, you know where we do eternal punishment for sin? No? You know what eternal means? Eternal sin? No, not eternal sin. What does the word eternal mean, Joseph? You don't know? It means it doesn't have a begin it doesn't end. No end. So punishment without end. Where do people do punishment without end? Hell? Very good. Yes. Takes away the eternal punishment, so that means you don't have to go to hell now for that sin. Well, you're not going to get sent to hell for that sin because you got that taken away. And then you said it takes away the temporal punishment. Is that true? Yeah. Yes. Is that false? No. It does not take the punishment to the sin. It does not? It does. It does. It does. Takes temporal punishment away, but not necessarily all of it. It depends upon uh, your uh, sorrow and your contrition. It doesn't. That's not a question in the book. I stuck that question in. It might be somewhere else, but it's not here. All right. So absolution of all the parts of the sacrament of penance, which is the most necessary? So what are the parts of the sacrament of penance? We have those already. I think we did. We're going to get him again. Contrition? Contrition, yes. Why contrition, William? Because you're not forgiving sorry. Yes, if you're not sorry, what happens? Then they're not forgiven. They're not forgiven, so that's the most essential one, contrition. Yes, very good. Of all the parts of the sacrament of penance, the most necessary is contrition, because without it, no pardon for sin is obtainable. You can't be forgiven. While with it alone, perfect pardon can be obtained, Provided that along with it there is a desire at least implicit of going to confession. So we have perfect contrition. We can get rid of our guilt of our sin as long as we desire to go to confession. The effects and the necessity of the sacrament of penance and the dispositions to receive it properly. What are the effects of the sacrament of penance? How is sin forgiven? We've had this, I think. 
Anastasia, can you raise your hand? Oh. Emily? Um, is it the God of Jesus Christ that got to Africa? Pardon me? Oh. Zachary. Sorry, that's so much not great. And what does that do? Forgive your sins. How does it forgive the sins? That's the question I'm asking. How? Maybe how? 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 I absolve me from your sins. No, 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 no. How? That's the cause. Christ absolved you. Your sins are forgiven. But how are they forgiven? By the authority of God. No. How? How? By how? By taking away the sin. Yeah. How does it do that? That's right. How? Remember, we had this before. Is sin something? It's nothing. It's nothing. Wait. So how does it how does it forgive sins now? Sin is nothing. Nothing. By grace. What? By grace. By sanctifying grace. Very good. You get sanctifying grace where there was nothing. Now there is sanctifying grace. See? So now you don't have nothing anymore. You have sanctifying grace. Because remember, sin drives grace out of the soul. You separate yourself from grace with sin, so to get sin forgiven, you need grace. So it gives you sanctifying grace to forgive your sins. Very good. Yes. The sacrament of penance, can, what is the effects of the sacrament of penance? This is a long answer. You should memorize it. The effects of the sacrament of, the sacrament of penance confer sanctifying grace which, by which are remitted, that means forgiven, the mortal sins and also the venial sins which we confess and for which we are sorry. It changes eternal punishment into temporal punishment, of which it even remits more or less according to our dispositions. Anything else? Emily? Doesn't it give us grace to not commit those sins again? Yes, that's right. It revives the merits of the good works. This is before that, though. The good works done before committing mortal sin. So because when you commit mortal sin, you lose all the merits of your good works. That you've done for your whole life. You lose them all. And when you get the remission of those sins, well, then uh, you get those merits back. So you don't have to start from scratch on ground floor again. You don't get sent down to here, and you've got to start climbing up again, see? So you get them back to where you were. And then you can continue to become holier. Because you got the, uh, the range of holiness, right? You're going up. And then if you commit a sin, you drop down to the bottom. But then when you get that sin forgiven, you go up to where you were or close to where you were, depending on how sorry you are for your sins. See? You might be a little bit lower, but you're up there uh, still continuing up, trying to get holier. It gives the soul aid in due time against falling into sin again. So it gives you aid, as somebody said that already. It helps you not to fall back into that sin. I'm sorry for it. And it restores peace of conscience. Peace of conscience. What does that mean, Benny? Conscience is quiet. Conscience is what? William. You don't feel guilty anymore. Yes. You don't have this burden of guilt on your conscience. Oh, I did that sin. So it restores peace of conscience. Now your conscience is at peace. See, it gives you that peace. You're not, you're not worried now. You don't have all this anxiety because of your sin. It takes all that away. It gives you peace of conscience. Yes, that's very important. Okay, here's an easy question and you might get wrong. Angela, is the sacrament of penance necessary to all for salvation? Yes, the sacrament of penance is necessary to all for salvation. Is that correct, Benny? Yes. William? Uh, Joseph? No. No what, Joseph? Not correct. What's the right answer then, uh, Joseph? If that was wrong, you got to come up with some right answer. Emily? We only need the sacrament of penance if we have committed more sin, but it is very much better to be able to have the sacrament of penance. Yeah, the sacrament of penance is necessary for salvation to all who have committed a mortal sin after baptism. So if you've never committed a mortal sin after baptism, then you don't need the sacrament of penance. Like St. Dominic Salvio, you need the sacrament of penance. Isn't absolutely necessary. It's only necessary if you commit a mortal sin 
after your baptism. So it's not a good idea not to commit mortal sins after your baptism. Mm -hmm. I got this. Is it a good thing to go to confession often? Emily? Yes, it is a good thing to go to confession often because not only does it remit eternal punishment due to sin, but also part of temporal punishment due to sin, but it gives us the grace to resist temptation and to not commit those sins again. Very good. That's pretty much the answer in the book. Different words, but the same answer. Yes, very good. Emily. Tides taking away sins, it gives the grace necessary to avoid sin in the future. So it says it is an excellent thing to go to confession often. Frequent confession is good. If it's to make a good confession, if you don't make a good confession, there's no point in going on. As a sacrament of penance, the power of remitting all sins, no matter how numerous or how great they are. So if you have a thousand sins, can the sacrament of penance take them away? Anastasia? No. How many can it take away? Fifty? One. Only one. Yes. So if you have fifty sins, can you keep them forgiven in penance? Yes. But not a thousand. No. How what's the, how many how many can the most you can get forgiven then? Ten? Ten? You think ten is the most? <laughs> no. There's no limit. Hundred, no, a thousand, ten thousand? A hundred thousand? A zillion? Well, a zillion, if you can remember all the zillion. I mean, you have to remember them to confess them. So, yeah, if you got a zillion, yeah. All right. The sacrament of penance has the power to remit all sins, no matter how numerous, how many there are, and how great they are, provided that it is received with the requisite dispositions. You have to have the proper disposition. You have to have a special contrition. See, for, Every one of your mortal sins, even if there's a zillion of them. Of that contrition. How many conditions are necessary to make a good confession? How many? What's the answer going to be? A number, right? How many? How many conditions are necessary to make a good confession? Five. Five. Very good. That's the right answer. To make a good confession, five things are necessary. What's the first one, William? It's not to be sorry for your sins. Sorry? To be sorry for your sins. But well, before that, what do you have to do? Zachary? Examination of conscience. Examination of conscience. What's the second one, Zachary? To confess your sins. Oh, William, second one. You examine your conscience. Then what? Zachary? Contrition. Contrition, you have to be sorry for your sins. So you say, I got these ten sins, I examine my conscience, I got these ten sins. Am I sorry for them? I'm sorry for that one. Uh, that one, uh, yeah. So you gotta be sorry for them all. Contrition. That's the most important thing, remember. Sorrow for having offended God. So if you're sorry, Joseph, because you got a spanking, is that good enough? No, that's not good enough. You can't be just sorry because you got a spanking. You have to be sorry because you offended God. Oh, yes. A resolution of sinning no more. I mean, you have to make up your mind, say, I'm not going to do that sin anymore. Number three. Then number four, William. So you examine your conscience. You're sorry for your sins. You made up your mind not to do them anymore. What do you do next? Tell the priest, very good. You can give, then you confess your sins. Right? Confess your sins. And then number five. How many? Do the penance that the priest gives you. Do the penance the priest gives you. Satisfaction or penance. Very good. So those are the five things necessary to make a good confession. Examination of conscience. Sorrow for your sins. Determination not to do them again. Confession. And then uh, penance. Do the penance the priest gives you. Yes. So remember those five things and make sure next time you go to confession, you say, if I examine my conscience, do I know what my sins are? See, that's what you have to examine your conscience to find out what your sins are. Okay. What should we do first of all? Okay, now first of all, before these five things, what should we do first of all? 
to make a good confession. So now there's something before the five things. Zachary. Pray to the Holy Ghost. Pray to the Holy Ghost. Very good. To make, to make a good confession, we should first of all earnestly beseech God to give us light to know all our sins and strength to detest them. I think we had that question. Detest. I remember that word. You know, detest them. So you detest your sins. So this might be where we where we did that. Uh, we, we started here and then we went backwards and now we're up to where we started from again I think is this where we started from did we already say what three things are required to make a sin mortal did we do that what are they Benny uh, pardon me yes doing it doing it Those aren't the three in the book, by the way. Anyway. Emily. Grave matter. Grave matter. That's number one. It's got to be something serious. All right. So something serious. Grave matter. Number two, Emily. Full knowledge. Full knowledge. It says full advertence here, but that's the same thing. Well, that's a bigger word here, though. Full, full knowledge, yes. And deliberate consent. Consent of the will. So, yes, I want to do that. That's what you say. So you say to yourself, is this grave matter? Yes, it is. Do I know it's grave matter? Yes, I do. Do I want to do it? Yes, I do. And then you made a moral sense. Yeah? Okay, that's what makes a mortal sense. Three things. So matter, advertence, and consent. Mac, like MacDonald. Mac. Matter, advertence, consent. Three things. Let's go back. Now, that was question 29. We skipped 25 to 28. What is the examination of conscience? Oh, that's easy. Anastasia, what's the examination of conscience? Examine means you look at something closely. When you look at it closely, you examine it. And some people examine bugs, you know, and they look at the bug and they watch the ants crawling around and they examine them. Well, you've got to examine your conscience, so it's a close look at your conscience. Right? Examination of conscience is a diligent search for the sins committed since the last good confession. So first of all, you've got to think, when was my last good confession? And then you say, okay, was it last week, last month, last year? Was it my first confession? Was that a good one? All right, so you've got to go back and say, when was my last good confession? And then examine your conscience since then. Now, how is the examination of conscience made? Emily? To pray the Holy Ghost and then proceed to think about all the sins you have committed. That's it. Yes. Made by carefully calling to mind before God all the sins committed but not confessed in thought. So any sins of thought you had, bad thoughts, words, sins of words. It's talking in church. Is that a sin of thought? What kind of sin is that? A word. Words. Yes. Same word. Yes. Deeds. That's something you do. And omission. What's omission? Omission. Does anybody know besides Emily? No? No, 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 you know Emily. Omission. What is the omission? Omission. Joseph said that. It's something you haven't done. It's something you don't do. Omission means you didn't do something. So you say, I didn't commit any sins, I didn't do anything. Yes, but your mother told you to sweep the floor. And you didn't do it. So that's the sin of omission. Something you didn't do that you should have done. So omission, sin of omission is something you didn't do that you were supposed to do. It's a sin of omission. So sins of thought, word, deed, and omission. So we examine our conscience, and we can consider the Ten Commandments. If we can't think of our sins, we can say the first commandment, do I sin against that? The second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, the tenth, or the commandments of the church, or our duties of our state. The duty of state, if you're in school, did I do my homework? If you're supposed to be on the playground, did I play? 
No, I didn't play when I was supposed to be playing. I said, is that a sin of omission? Huh? I'm told to go out and play, and you don't, you don't go play? Yeah. Ah, you're supposed to be playing, you're supposed to play. Are you pleased God? Hmm. You That's what one of the saints said. You were supposed to be playing then. Yeah. Time for play. And uh, somebody came to him and said, what would you do now if somebody told you the end of the world is going to end in 30 seconds? And he said, I keep playing because that's what I'm supposed to be doing now. Mm -hmm. It's a mistake to play right there at that moment. Okay? Playtime. Mm -hmm. We should also examine ourselves on our bad habits. If you have a bad habit, you have to uproot it. You gotta get rid of that bad habit. So you gotta struggle especially against your bad habits. See? The bad habits and on the occasions of sin. Occasions of sin. Am I avoiding the occasions of sin? And there are bad habits and occasions. That's very important to examine ourselves on those things. So yes, I have to get rid of my bad habits. In our examination, should we also try to discover the number of our sins? How many times we did the sin? Should we try to discover that? Do we have to discover that, Zachary? Yes, uh, for mortal sins. For, for mortal sins, we have to discover the number, yes. We have to confess the number. We can't say, I committed this mortal sin. And if, we, if you did it 20 times, you got to say, I did it 20 times. If you did it one time, you just say, well, I did it one time. I mean, so you don't need to say the number of sins of times you committed doing so. No, you don't need to try to say the number of times you committed doing so. That's not required, no. <coughs> okay. So those are those questions. Okay, we'll go on. What is the matter, grave matter? What does grave mean? Does that mean like the dirt you put in a, in a grave when somebody dies? Is that grave matter, Joseph? Yes. That would be grave matter, yes. Is that what it means here? Zachary? Like it's a big offense. Yes. Serious. Serious, yes. Grave means heavy. We have the word gravity. You ever hear the word gravity? So grave comes, uh, gravity comes from grave. Grave means heavy. So it's heavy matter. It's not light. Light matter is venial sins, gray matter is something serious. Yeah. It's heavy. It's so heavy that it takes sanctifying grace out of your soul. Grave matter. So when is the matter grave? The matter is grave when the thing under examination is seriously contrary to the laws of God and of his church. So if you steal a raisin, is that grave? What about the grapevine that the raisin came from? That was more grave, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's uh, we can't, seriously contrary to the laws of God and His church. When is there full advertence in sinning? Full of virtues and sinning, that means you're paying attention to it, is when we know perfectly well that we're doing a serious evil. So you know you're doing something wrong. You know you're thinking something wrong. You know you're, you know you're saying something wrong. You not, know you're not doing something that's very serious responsibility. You do. So yes, so it's a... So we have to know that we're, we know we're doing it bad. We know we're being bad. When is the perfect consent of the will verified? Verified. What does that mean? The perfect consent of the will verified in sinning. Verified. Uh, Zachary. Like the one Pardon me. The law. Uh... Emily. Check, to verify to check. Verify to check, that's a good explanation. Yeah, you check, yes, did I, did I want to do that? See, verify, consent of the will. You verify the consent of your will, you check, did I want to do that sin? 
And then we have consent of the will. Perfect consent of the will is verified in sinning when we deliberately determine to do a thing, although we know that thing to be sinful. So we know it's wrong, we know it's a sin, and we say, I'm going to do it anyway. Yes, perfect consent of the will. If it's grave matter, that makes it a grave sin. Where is sin? In what part of the where is sin in the soul? William. Is it the guts? What? The guts. The guts of the soul? The soul doesn't have guts, does it? The devil lives in the guts. The devil lives in what? The guts. The guts. How do you spell guts? G-U-T-S. It's in the guts. No, I don't think that's correct. Uh, Benny, where is the sin? All right, what what uh, what do you have? What is your what? Describe the soul. Describe the soul. What is the soul like? What is the soul, William, uh, uh, Joseph? Okay. You don't know what the soul is. The soul, the soul is part of your body. No, it's not part of your body. Mm. The soul means you can talk. You can talk. Yes, if you didn't have a soul, you couldn't talk. Just know what the soul means. Everything. So the spirit. A pure spirit. Yes, it's the spirit. It's the spirit that has understanding and will. Understanding and will. Yes, God is a spirit with understanding and will, isn't he? And he'll never die. It's immortal. He'll never die because it's a spirit. So where is the sin? Emily? My soul? Yes? You be more precise. What's, it's what there is in my soul. It's in your will. You chose to do the sin. Really? You have an evil will. Peace on earth to men of good will. Who said that? Peace on earth. Angela. The angel said that. Peace on earth to men of good will. So if you, have, if you commit a sin and you choose to commit a sin, you have a bad will. The sin is in the will. I will to do what God doesn't want me to do. What were we talking about that for? Perfect consent of the will is verified when we deliberately determine to do a thing, although we know the thing to be sinful. What diligence should be used in the examination of conscience? Diligence. What does diligence mean? Do something well? Yes. Pardon me? To, to be quick? To be quick? Something? Not necessarily when quick. Diligence, diligence doesn't necessarily be quick. When, you do, when you're diligent, I mean, you do things properly, neatly, and well. Yes, correctly. Very good. Yes. Uh, you make an effort to do it correctly and right and well. Yes. Diligence. So, diligence in doing the examination of conscience. Sometimes they say due diligence in court. It's due diligence. Examination of conscience, the same diligence is demanded as is used in a matter of great importance. This is a great matter, a very important matter, examination of conscience. How much time should be spent in the examination of conscience? Emily. Enough time for us to know our sins well? Enough, yes. Well, yeah, enough time to. We should spend more time being sorry for our sins, shouldn't we, than knowing, knowing them? But more or less time should be spent in examination of conscience according to the needs of each case. That is, according to the number and kind of sins that burden the conscience, and according to the time that has last since the last good confession. So, if your last good confession was yesterday, you don't need to spend as much time in examining your conscience. You only have to look at one day. So, uh, How may the examination of conscience be rendered easy? Well, we can look at the commandments and see if they yes. obey the commandments. Yeah. It's made easy though if you examination your conscience, if you examine your conscience every day, every evening. Examination of conscience, the evening is examination of conscience, and you say your act of contrition, then you've already examined that day already once. And so when you go to make your confession, you already, you already kind of know what you did that day, see? 
better. It makes it easier to examine your conscience for your confession if you do it every night. So when you do your treasure sheet, this is a good time to examine your conscience. Examine your conscience and say, okay, did I do any sins? Or how much time do we have? We've got 10 more minutes here. Okay, good. So after the examination of conscience, we have number two. There's contrition for our sins, yes. Sorrow for sin. What is sorrow for sin? Anastasia, do you know? Sorrow for sin? Do you know what sorrow is? Have you ever been sad? Sorrow? Joseph, what's sorrow for sin? Sadness. Sadness, yes, that's right. Grieving with losses. Yes, it consists of grief of soul. And a sincere, sincere, sincere detestation of the offense offered to God. So we think, I offended God by this sin. So we think about God and say, God is almighty. God is all good. He's all perfect. He's all knowing. And I deliberately offended him by this sin. So, so I should be sorry for that and have grief of my soul that I uh, offended God. Mm. The offense offered to God. All right, this is an easy question if you know the answer. It's hard if you don't know the answer. William, how many kinds of sorrow are there? Five. Five? No, oh, that was five was the other one. How many kinds of sorrow, William? One. One? No, Benny. Seven. Can you name them? Joseph. You're going to say seven as well. How many kinds of sorrow are there? How many? Two. Two. What are they, William? Benny, Zachary, what are they? Spiritual sorrow. Spiritual sorrow. No, that's not right. Angela. Internal and external. Pardon me? Internal and external. Internal and external? Uh, that's true. Yes, that's true. Yes. We can, some, some people are just sorry externally, they're sorry just with their lips. You go up to somebody and go, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you're walking down the street, sorry. <laughs> you're not really sorry at all, you're just external sorrow, right? So external and internal, that's a good division, Angela, that's not the correct one here. All right, so yes, sometimes your sorrow is supposed to be internal, yes. Uh, 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 Emily? Perfect and imperfect. Perfect and imperfect, yeah, perfect contrition. An imperfect contrition. So those are the two types of sorrow. Yes. Why do you call the sorrow of contrition perfect sorrow? Wait here. Perfect sorrow. What is perfect sorrow? Perfect sorrow is a grief of soul for having offended God because he is good, infinitely good, and worthy of being loved for his own sake. So God is good and worthy of being loved for his own sake. What does it mean for his own sake? We love God for his own sake. Emily? We love him because he loves us, not because we want to get to heaven or because we're trying to um, gain favors. We love him. Right, yes. So if you're a farmer and you pray for rain and God sends you rain, say, so I love God because of his rain. All right, well, that's good. But that's not loving him for his own sake. That's loving him for the good rain he gave you for your farm so your crops grew. Mm -hmm. And uh, things like that. So that's not loving him for his own sake. That's loving him for his goods and the goods he gives us. Mm -hmm. Like if you love God because he gave you good health, well, thank you, God, for my good health. I love you for that. Well, that's good to love him for that. But we should that's not loving him for his own sake. So I call the sorrow of contrition perfect sorrow for two reasons. Why do you call the sorrow of contrition perfect sorrow? Two reasons. One, because it considers the goodness of God alone and not our own advantage or loss. Not your own advantage or not. Not something that you got from it. From God's goodness. Yeah. Two, because it enables us at once to obtain pardon for sins, even though the obligation to confess them still remains. So perfect contrition 
we love God, we're sorry because we offended God, we love for his own sake, well, that forgives us our sins. Right? But we still have to go to confession, don't we? For mortal sins, yes. Perfect sorrow obtains pardon of our sins independently of confession. Is that true? Perfect contrition, does that take, take pardon of your sins independently of confession? Independently, without considering confession. Emily? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Is that true, Angela? You're not sure. Benny? Zachary? Anastasia? It is. It is. It does. Eh? Uh, it, it helps forgive all our sins, but it's more to we should try and go to confession as soon as we can. Should try? Yes, you have to, don't you? Perfect sin, sorrow does not obtain us pardon of our sins independently of confession. It does not. So the answer is no, not yes. Because it always includes the intention to confess them. You have to have the intention to go to confession as soon as possible. If you have perfect sorrow, you want to get rid of your sins, you know we can get rid of them by perfect sorrow. But our perfect sorrow says, oh, well, I want to get rid of those sins by confession. You have to do that. Why does perfect sorrow or contrition produce the effect of restoring us to the grace of God? Joseph. Right, okay, yes, but that's not the question here. Yep, okay, that's not the answer we're looking for. All right, go, 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 get out of here, come on, go. All right, perfect sorrow or contrition produces this effect it uh, restores us to the grace of God because it proceeds from charity which cannot exist in the soul together with sin. So your perfect contrition comes from charity and love of God and that cannot be in the soul at the same time as the state of mortal sin. Mortal sin throws charity out of the soul. So you got an actual grace, to have perfect contrition you got an actual grace so that allows you, that. well then you can't go. So the answer is no. So the answer to your question was no. Not yes. Okay. okay. All right, where are we at now? Oh, yes. Because it gives charity, and charity, you can't have charity and sin in the soul at the same time. You can't love God and have sin in your soul, mortal sin. All right. What is imperfect sorrow or attrition, Zachary? When you're sorry because you feel guilty about committing that sin. Yes. And you're not really sorry because it offended God. No, you're still sorry because it offended God. Emily? Perfect contrition is when we are sorry for us. That's not the question. You're answering a different question of what we're asking. Angela? Is it why we're just sorry because we're scared to go to hell? Yes, that would be one of the reasons, yes. Imperfect sorrow or attrition is that by which we repent of having offended God because he's our supreme judge. That is for fear of the chastisement deserved in this life. We'll keep talking about this chastisement that's coming. The chastisement deserved in this life or in the life to come or because of the very fallness of sin itself. Look how ugly the sin is. Sin is ugly. I got this ugly sin in my soul. Now my soul is ugly because of the sin. I'm sorry for that. I don't like having an ugly soul. And uh, I don't like going to hell, as Zachary said. And so that's imperfect contrition or attrition. So it has to be from a supernatural reason. Like I said, if you're sorry for your sin because you got a spanking, well, that's not uh, even imperfect contrition. Right? That's less than imperfect contrition. You're sorry about the punishment you already got. What qualities must sorrow have to have be true sorrow? This is interesting. Qualities to be true sorrow. This is what uh, Angela was answering earlier. True sorrow, Angela. It has to be external. External? Uh, internal. 
Internal, yes. It's got four here. True sorrow, four qualities. Number one is internal. What does that mean? That means you don't just say that you actually feel the sorrow. You inside. feel the sorrow, yeah. So internal, very good. Two. What's two? Where is this now? Oh yeah, we've already covered this. True sorrow. It's got to be supernatural. So it's got to have a supernatural motive. We're sorrow because we offended God whom we love. We're sorrow because we fear going to hell, which is something supernatural. We don't want to go there. Okay. Supernatural. Supreme. What does supreme mean? We're probably going to get these in these next four questions. Supreme means the highest. The highest, yes. And four, universal. What does universal mean? Everywhere. Every what? Everywhere. Everywhere. It doesn't mean everywhere in this case. What does it mean in this case? All right, what are we talking about? True sorrow. True sorrow for what? All right, so what do we mean by universal when we're talking about true sorrow for sins? Angela? Sins committed everywhere. Sins committed no matter where you committed them? Uh, like by anyone? No. We're talking about your sins. You might not know what the neighbor's sins are. Emily? We're all sins. All your sins, universal for all your sins. You can't say, I'm, I'm sorry for these three sins, but I'm not sorry for that one. Hmm? you got to make yourself... Sorrow for that one too, yes. Okay. Internal sorrow must be because the will, which has alienated from God by sin, must return to God by detesting the sin committed. So with your will turned away from God, separated from God, it says, I don't want to go the way God wants me to go, I want to go down the way the devil wants me to go, or the world wants me to go, or the flesh, so now i got to turn around, see? So it's got to be internal in the will. Say, I want to go back to God. Eternal. Supernatural. Supernatural. This is hard. Huh? It means it must be exciting in us by the grace of God and conceived through motives of faith. How is it exciting in us by the grace of God, the sorrow? We committed this sin now, this mortal sin, and we need sorrow for it. God gives us the grace to repent. God gives you a grace to repent. What kind of grace is that? Actual grace. He gives you an actual grace. He offers you an actual grace. You don't really give an actual grace. You offer one. God offers them. But you might refuse it. I don't like that one, God. Give me a different one. Maybe God will give you a different one. Maybe he won't. Actual grace. You need an actual grace to repent. Yes. Citing us by the grace of God and conceived through motives of faith. Motives of faith. So something that we believe, a motive of faith. What does a motive mean? A reason to do it. A reason, yes. Something that prompts us to do something? Yes, this reason or prompts you to do it. Motive is, it comes from the word to move, see? motor moves you, moves the car, you know, it moves you, so something moves you, a motive, what moves you to do this? That's what they look for in the uh, detective novels, or the murder, murder cases, where you say, what was the motive? Why did he kill this guy? So if they figure out why he killed him, they can better maybe find out who it was. So they look for a motive, we have a motive for this case. It moves the person to do it. So we need a motive of faith. So a motive coming from our faith, so you have to have faith, first of all, right? And you have to have a motive coming from the faith, like the fear of hell, like the, the ugliness of sin, something like this, see? So we know from our faith, okay? and the grace of God. So that's why we say it's supernatural. And so why, must, why does sorrow have to be supernatural? Emily. The sin we commit and the grace that fathers 
and God finds it is supernatural, so we have to have supernatural. Is the sin supernatural? No. No, not necessarily. Who said no? Very good. Yeah, no, the sin is not necessarily supernatural. The sin of a, a sin of gluttony is that supernatural? No, that's from Saturday you want to you want to satisfy the flesh, all right? Satisfy the flesh more than the flesh wants to be satisfied even sometimes. Angela. But it does get rid of grace, which is supernatural. So yeah, it gets rid of grace, which is supernatural. But the sin is not supernatural usually. It's usually the sin is something. The sin could be supernatural if it's direct hatred of God or something. You could say, but usually sins are involved with our our, our body or our, our mind and uh, their their natural sense. Not necessarily on a supernatural plane, but they cause a supernatural loss. See, the effect of the sin is supernatural, causes a supernatural loss if we lose sanctifying grace. Sorrow must be supernatural because the end to which it is directed is supernatural, namely God's pardon. So I want pardon from God for my sin. I want the acquisition of sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is supernatural. And I want the right to eternal glory. Oh, that's a Right, you want the right to eternal glory. Is the right to go to heaven? Oh, you're baptized. Baptized and makes you an heir of heaven. Yes. So you got to not commit a mortal sin, so you can't go there. Yes. Explain more clearly the difference between natural and supernatural sorrow. Well, let's look at this one. Natural sorrow and supernatural sorrow. He who repents of having offended God, because God is infinitely good and worthy of being loved for his own sake, of having lost heaven and merited hell, or because of the intrinsic malice of sin has supernatural sorrow, since all these are motives of faith. On the contrary, he who repents only because of the dishonor or chastisement inflicted by men, right, somebody saw you do that evil sin and you're embarrassed now, right? Uh, inflicted by men, or because of some purely temporal loss, you know, purely temporal loss, you smashed your car because of your sin, you know, as a natural sorrow, since he repents from human motives alone. You know, so our sorrow must be supernatural. Okay, it's, it's past time for rosary. We're late. The bell is ringing. Okay, pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.